Kundai Mwari be thankful unto the mother, father, creative life force of the universe. Kudzai Mudzimo Mukuru. Give praises unto our great ancestors. Abibi Tumi, Abibi Fahodie, African power and African liberation for all African people. This is Shakara back after a long hiatus with another edition of the Pan African question where we break down, you know, bite size, yeah, questions in relation to Pan African theory, practice, and implementation today is the first of the month called mosaya yeah mosaya we named the eighth month of the year after the most eminent prophet and king his excellency marcus mosiah garvey because this is the uh, month of his birth and so we don't call it argos no more we refer to it as mosiah so this is the first of mosiah and because it is the first of mosiah i thought it would be appropriate to reinstate and reinstall the Pan-African question on the question of what is Garveyism? We're going to be breaking down the primary and fundamental principles of the ideology of Garveyism. And to do that, we're going to be using the words of the prophet himself, of Marcus Messiah Garvey himself primarily. We're going to explore the actions of the UNIA ACL in implementing this philosophy. But because we know that the UNIA ACL is an organization come government, yes, and that Garveyism is a movement, yeah. We're gonna um you know rely on and draw on the wellspring of other brothers and sisters, particularly from the time of Marcus Mazaya Garvey himself, in order to elucidate what is meant by Garveyism. So first and foremost, it's necessary to explain yeah, that what is referred to as Garveyism is more specifically within the Garvey movement referred to by two primary names or titles. The first is African fundamentalism. Yes, African fundamentalism takes its name from an essay that Papa Garvey wrote in 1924. And that essay became a pamphlet. It was republished in the Negro World newspaper a number of times. Uh, and this became one of the, the clearest ideological, most popularized ideological statements uh, of uh, Marcus Messiah Garvey, the most eminent prophet and king, um, you know, himself, yeah, as promoted by the UNIA ACO, all right, African fundamentalism. The second name or title is Universal African Nationalism, which is used very often uh, by Garveyites, yeah, and probably throughout uh, this episode, I'm going to be using universal African nationalism uh, more frequently, all right? But it would be good uh, to break down these words, each word and their definitions to give, um, you know, uh, greater emphasis to why these terminologies are used. And so we begin with African, that should speak for itself, all right, but there's a lot of confusion about that. Um, in this day and age, and that's probably going to be an episode in and of itself, except to say that when we say African, we are referring to the indigenous black people of the African continent uh, as they exist on the African continent and throughout the African diaspora, yeah? And I'm sure most people understand what we mean when we said that, all right? Um, and there'll be more on that a little bit later. But African fundamentalism, what do we mean by fundamentalism? Fundamentalism is defined as a movement or attitude stressing strict and literal adherence to a set of basic principles or the practice of following very strictly the basic principles of any subject or ideology. Yeah. So basically, African fundamentalism is the idea that there are certain basic principles, yes, and values, ideas, goals and objectives that relate to what it means to be an African in this dispensation of time, yes, and that African life should be governed by an adherence to those basic uh, principles, yeah. Um, understanding the goal is liberation, yes, of African people. Then we come to universal African nationalism. We've already defined African. So what does universal mean? Universal is defined as including or covering all or a whole collectively or distributively without limit or exception, affirming or denying something of all members of a class or of all values of a variable, adapted or adjustable to meet varied requirements. 
So as I'm sure you've realized, the universal, the word universal repeats itself in the name of the organization and the government itself. The Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, all right? Uh, and the term universal was used for various different auxiliaries of the UNIA ACL um, as well, and is used for various different auxiliaries of the UNIA ACL. So the idea is that universal African nationalism is designed to relate to and pertain to all African people as a whole collectively and work in our collective, yes, best interest. It also means, yeah, that African nationalism relates to and pertains to all aspects of our lives and can be and should be in theory applied to every area of people activity as far as African people are concerned, which means that whatever activity we are engaging in our lives should be geared towards the goal of achieving African nationalism. So let's define nationalism. Nationalism is defined as loyalty and devotion to a nation, a sense of national consciousness, exalting one nation above all others, and placing primary emphasis on promotion of its culture and interests as opposed to those of other nations or suprana supranational groups. A nation's wish and attempt to be politically independent. So most of those definitions speak for themselves, yeah? We are considering ourselves as African people to be a nation first and foremost, and to be about the business of creating a nation at the same time, yes? So on one hand, the nation is conceptual. On the other hand, we are trying to make it concrete. And for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna add the definition that we use in the al and Revivalist Movement, which is the organization that I was born and raised in. Nationalism is building and maintaining autonomous nations and communities with institutions designed to promote, preserve, and protect African lives by any means necessary. So what are the fundamental principles of universal African nationalism? Well, yeah, the foremost scholar on the life and legacy of the most honourable Marcus Mazaya Garvey is a now ancestor by the name of Baba Tony Martin, who is the author of this great and illuminating book, Race First, yes, the ideological and organisational struggles of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. This book comes highly recommended for those who want a basic overview of Garvey and Garveyism, all right? But as, as the foremost scholar, he identifies uh, three primary principles of universal African nationalism or African fundamentalism. Uh, and as the al kebla and Revivalist Movement, through our studies of Papa Garvey, we've added one, and I do say, uh, uh, thankfully, with the blessing, yes, of uh, Baba Tony Martin himself. And so the four fundamental principles of Garveyism are race first, self-reliance, nationhood, and as added by the al kebla Revivalist Movement, African spiritual orthodoxy. Race first, what is race first? Let's begin with the words of the most honorable himself. In a world of wolves, one should go armed, and one of the most powerful defensive weapons within reach of Negroes is the practice of race first in all parts of the world. Put your race first, like all other races do. So in this context, the race is synonymous with terms like Negro, which was the capital N Negro, which was the, the, the one of the primary terminologies which was used here yeah, at the time to refer to uh, us, uh, even though that was being challenged at the time and we reject it today, and African, yes? So you have the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League. The race, Negro and African, yes, um, are synonymous terminologies within this context. The idea being that the race, as characterized by shared ancestry and shared culture, shared historical experiences, is a biocultural 
entity, yes, a biocultural entity that have certain interests that are inherent to it based upon its current condition, position and historical uh, experience. Through what we call the Ma'afa, African people have been subjected to invasion, conquest, enslavement, colonization and neocolonization. And this gives us uh, a shared experience, yes, that has brought us to where we are um, in today's world. And so therefore, the biocultural entity also is inherently a political entity, again, with certain goals and objectives that are inherent to it based upon its current position and condition. As a result, race consciousness, yes, becomes a vital prerequisite of race first. In other words, the race must become aware of itself as a biocultural and political entity and therefore work towards solving its problems, its own problems, based upon its own agency. And so that, that but the awareness must come first. Every liberation movement must solve the problem of identity, identifying who and what the people are, and then from that foundation, identifying their collective interests, all right? As Papa Garvey states himself, no man can convince me contrary to my belief because my belief is founded upon a hard and horrible experience, not a personal experience, but a racial experience. The world has made being black a crime and I have felt in common with men who suffer like me and instead of making it a crime, I hope to make it a virtue. So race consciousness must be accompanied by race pride. And this is important because as African people being taken through the Ma'afa, we were indoctrinated into a consciousness of self-hatred, self-denigration. Everything about being black and African was demonized from our physiognomy, our phenotype, to our culture, our civilization. Like they said we never had no civilization. It was barbaric and savage, yes? Uh, and in particular, in the context of our culture, uh, our indigenous spiritual systems. And so, in order to uh, actualize the principle of race first, race consciousness had to be accompanied by race pride, which means res the restoration of dignity to the race, the restoration of pride to what the race looks like and how the race behaves, how the race sings, dances, uh, how the race walks and talks, yeah? How the race ceremonializes and ritualizes, etc., etc., etc. And this was imperative because of the condition of the world as we know it. And um, Papa Gavi gives expression to this in our next quotation, which says, The world is not in the disposition to divide the spoils of materialism, but on the contrary, every group is seeking the aggrandizement of self at the expense of those who have lost or who ignore the trend of human effort in the direction of self-preservation. The Negro, surrounded as he is, has no other alternative than going forward in the atmosphere of racial self-interest, working for the generation of the present and providing for those of our posterity. In the service of the race, the Universal Negro Improvement Association finds its program and for its advocacy or promotion, we offer no apology. So for Papa Garvey, race first was the only logical response, the only possible logical response to uh, what we had experienced as African people and what was taking place uh, in the world at that time. It, the idea is that every race was seeking to work out its own problems to its own benefit. And in order to survive and prosper in the world, African people had to begin to do the same. This also, however, required us, if we look at race consciousness and race pride, it also meant that we had to reject the racial indoctrination um, of other groups of people. In this, in this instance, particularly um, that of Europeans within the institution of uh, global uh, white supremacy, European and Western imperialism. And this rejection yeah, of whiteness uh, was given expression in a beautiful poem that was written by a sister contributor to the Negro World newspaper of the time. Yeah? And the poem is called 
The New Negro Woman's Attitude Towards the White Man by Estella Matthews. And she says, laugh with your lustful eyes. We will never bend our knees. The shackles ne'er again shall bind the arms which now are free. Some strike for hope of beauty, some for the hope of pride. We battle to defend our all for which our mothers died. We loathe you in our bosoms. We scorn you with our eyes. We despise you with our latest breath and fight you till we die. We never will ask you quarters and we never will be your slave, but we will swim the sea of virtue till we sink beneath the waves. So we see that race first required us here yeah, to affirm ourselves and reject uh, consciously the psychology of the oppression of whiteness in the affirmation of ourselves. So that was race first. The next fundamental principle of universal African nationalism is that of self-reliance. And this is explained in the following words from the most honorable. Power is the only argument that satisfies man, except the individual, the nation, the race has power that is exclusive that individual, nation or race will be bound by the will of others who possess this great qualification. Hence, it is advisable for the Negro to get power of every kind, power in education, power in science, power in industry, power in politics, power in higher government, that kind of power that will stand out so that other races and nations will see if not feel. Them words there should really speak for themselves. Yeah, it's necessary to emphasize, however, that many people in this day and age try to reduce, yeah, um, Papa Garvey and the UNIA ACO emphasis on self-reliance to just business, black business, yeah, circulating the black pound, black people starting businesses and interacting and networking with each other. But we see here that Papa Garvey is talking about power in economics but also power in science, power in higher government, power in politics, power in education. And so the self-reliance as far as the UNIA ACO was concerned, as far as universal African nationalism is concerned, goes beyond just black business. And that's not to downplay the importance of black business. It is important. However, limiting self-reliance to just black business doesn't do justice to what the universal African nationalist philosophy is espousing. Essentially, we're going beyond just business development to institution building. And the UNIA ACL program was under uh, the most eminent prophet Marcus Mazai Garvey and is today an institution building program. So the importance of institution building is explained by Papa Garvey in the course of African philosophy, which is housed in the book published by Baba Tony Martin, referred to as Message to the People. Organized society is always a mass of people and as such cannot do anything explicit or by detail by themselves. Hence, the organizing of institutions to do the particular work that cannot be done by the masses as a whole. In our present civilization, no society would be considered functioning properly if such institutions did not exist. Therefore, it is necessary for the Negro to pay close attention to developing the appreciation for institutional life. It is not necessary or binding that he copies completely the systems, methods or manners of these institutions except insofar as they would go to help him to promote a higher life and in accomplishing the most out of this organised society. It is incumbent upon him that he also have and control his own institutions based upon his own cultural and civilised idealism. His universities and schools may engage in the same process of education, but with an adopted curriculum necessary 
for the special benefit of the Negro. His clubs, academies and unions should be modelled in the same way with the absolute objective of attaining the end that is particularly desired by the race. It is through the institutions of a race that the civilization and culture of the race is built. The Negro should occupy himself in cultivating his own culture and ultimately achieving his own civilized ends so that in the comparison of racial achievement, he may be able to stand out distinctly on those achievements on his own account as others may do. So we see here a concrete analysis and also a philosophical analysis here. Not only must the race have its own institutions, but the institutions of the race must be serving an objective that is particular to the race and based upon ideals that are also peculiar to uh, the race. Yeah, As he explains it here, our own culture and civilized idealisms. And this takes into consideration also where the resources come from, whose and what resources we use yeah, uh, in uh, pursuit of this institution building endeavor. And so we live in a context in which, and they were at that time living in a context in which uh, the powers that be in Western imperialism were attempting to buy off and curry favor certain organizations and groups towards achieving its own goals and its own ends. And so we see an, an, an example of this, yeah, with uh, Baba Carter G. Woodson, all right? And we're going to um, look at the an essay or an article written by one of the leading members of the UNIA ACL of that time, Robert L. Poston, responding to some money, yes, that Baba Carter G. Woodson, who is the father of Black History and Black History Month, the founder of Black History Month, was given by certain institutions, yeah, to continue the study of uh, black history. And Baba Robert L. Poston responds in this way. In an article written in 1922, entitled Wall Street Gives 50,000 for the Study of Negro History, Baba Robert L. Poston states, the Daily Press announced last week that the Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations have given 50,000 to Carter G. Woodson to be used for the study of Negro history. We are not among those who think that every gift coming from white people has strings attached to it and should be considered as dangerous. But in view of the fact that gifts coming from the above named foundations are always questionable, we wish to remind those who have to do with the spending of this money of some dangers that may lurk in the way. While it is hoped that the 50,000 given to Mr. Woodson for the study of Negro history is given without any harmful conditions attached to it, yet there is always a possibility that such is not the case and it is up to the people to see to it that these wealthy men with their money do not impose upon us a viewpoint detrimental to our best interests. Mr. Woodson, with whom we are acquainted, is a highly educated gentleman who gives us the impression of being a new Negro. But there is a danger in spending money given to you by other people. And Mr. Woodson's job is going to be to spend Rockefeller and Carnegie's money without accepting Rockefeller and Carnegie's viewpoint. We trust that Mr. Woodson will be successful in doing this. But in the event that he is not, God help us all, for nothing could have a more harmful effect on the Negro than a Negro history dictated by white capitalists. It's a very interesting article. And if you want to read it in its full, you can check out this particular book, yeah, African Fundamentalism, also edited by Baba Tony Martin. And it, as it says, is a literary and cultural anthology of Garvey's Harlem Renaissance. All right. So check it out um, in this book. And the concerns of Baba Robert L. Poston uh, are laid bare in the excerpt that I've just read. We're talking about um, the danger of uh, receiving money from non-African sources to do work on behalf of 
African people. The UNIA was very particular, yes, about funding uh, its, its projects from within uh, the race. And it is necessary to know that Baba Carter G. Woodson himself became one of the most vociferous voices against receiving white money for the telling of uh, black history and got into a lot of problems with a lot of other people for standing firm on that position. So to his credit, Baba Carter G. Woodson also came to that understanding and that realization himself and acted upon it in terms of how he engaged his profession uh, as a historian. Big respect, yeah, and honor, Mojuba, as is said in Yoruba, to the ancestors, uh, Robert L. Poston and Carter G. Woodson. So how did the UNIA ACL action, yeah, the principle of self-reliance in a number uh, and a myriad of ways, yeah? First of all, we know um, that the UNIA ACL developed two shipping lines, yeah? One was the Black Star Line, which is most famous for, the other was the Black Cross um, Navigation and Trading Company, all right? You also had the Negro Factories Corporation, which housed under it a number of different businesses from restaurants to laundrettes, doll making, millinery, um, clothes making, um, and other uh, businesses. Yeah, you had it, uh, the UNIA LCA had its own media, the Negro World uh, newspaper, and the Black Man uh, magazine and newspaper. Most notably, uh, there were paramilitary um, uh, auxiliaries of the UNIA, most notably the Universal African Legion and the Universal Motor Corps. And the Universal Motor Corps is, uh, is important because that is uh, a women's military trained unit. Yeah? So the women of the UNIA ACL are being uh, militarily trained. The UNIA ACL also had a nursing agency through which it trained its own nurses and midwives. Yeah? And this was the Universal Black Cross nurses that was producing uh, material on uh, tr natural remedies for treating uh, everyday illnesses and also treating members and giving birth to UNIA babies and our kind of different thing. In fact, the um, Universal Black Cross Nurses was said to be the most active auxiliary of the UNIA and it was made up exclusively of African women. The UNIA ACL also had various different schools um, and a short-lived university for the education uh, of its children and also uh, forwarding towards the next principle, an industrial uh, African development program. And we're gonna go into that shortly. And with that, we go on to the third principle of universal African nationalism or African fundamentalism, which is nationhood, all right? Again, we're gonna begin with the words of the prophet himself, as he says, nationhood, is the only means by which modern civilization can completely protect itself. Independence of nationality, independence of government is the means of protecting not only the individual, but the group. Nationhood is the highest ideal of all people. In the course of African philosophy, also known as message to the people, he goes on to say, no race is free until it has a strong nation of its own, its own system of government and its own order of society. Never give up this idea. Never be satisfied to always live under the government of other people because you will always be at their mercy. Visualize for yourself and for your children and generations unborn, your own kings, emperors, presidents, your own government officials and administrators who look like you. In the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Messiah Garvey, he says, we cannot allow a continuation of the crimes against our race as 400 million men, women and children worthy of the existence given us by the divine creator we are determined to solve our own problems by redeeming our motherland Africa from the hands of alien exploiters and found there a government, a nation of our own, strong enough to lend protection to the members of our race, scattered all over the world and to compel the respect of the nations and races of the earth. So this is the principle of self-reliance taken to its own ultimate conclusion understanding that self-reliance as related to nation building nation building is social economic and political organization and the highest expression of that is nationhood 
nation building, yes, and nation uh, maintenance. And that is to say, if we work in all areas of people activity towards our own benefit, our conceptual ideal of nationhood will become concrete, yeah, in actual uh, ultimate institutions and related institutions that are working on behalf of the race. And the UNIA actioned the principle of nationhood in many different ways, yeah. First and foremost, in 1920, uh, at the, the, the International Convention of the Negro Peoples of the World, it elected a government in exile, yeah, that was to work uh, for the total liberation of the African continent and African people around the world, overstanding that at that time, we're talking about the African continent having been recently colonized completely by uh, European powers, all right? And, and so it worked towards that goal in various other ways through the government now that it had established, the government in, in exile that it had established and had elected leaders of, yeah? Uh, they did things like petitioning the, the League of Nations, for example, after World, Mass European War One, misnomered World War One, um, petitioning the Western powers for the return, yeah, of the lands that were formerly colonized by Germany and confiscated by the rest of Europe as a result of uh, mass European War I machinations, the UNIA and others petitioned to have those lands returned to African people. And um, its most definitive and sustained uh, pursuit of nationhood, however, or the beginning stages of nationhood, was in its Liberia program, which is a video in and of itself, but just as a, a key point, uh, in the year 1924, the UNIA ACL sent um uh, a ship yeah with an estimated fifty thousand dollars worth of agricultural and industrial equipment along with a team of experts who had been to um been to mama africa in this instance liberia uh prior to a number of times to canvas and as and, and create opportunities in that nation uh, and so they sent a team of experts and engineers to begin agriculture and economic development within uh, beginning in the nation of Liberia and form a basis, a headquarters in Liberia through which to spread, from which to spread the principle of nationhood across the African continent and across the, the African world. And then you also have the People's Political Party, which was started in the island of Jamaica, which among other things, worked towards the federation, yes, of the Caribbean, bringing the Caribbean into a unified uh, government in order to protect itself from the machinations of European imperialism. So this is, these are the various different ways in which the UNIA ACL under the leadership of the most honorable Marcus Mazaya Garvey actioned the principle of nationhood. Incidentally, in a similar way to which people tend to reduce self-reliance to just business, people often reduce the ideal of nationhood. And in fact, Garveyism in general, and they, they reduce the entirety of Garveyism to a phrase by the name of back to Africa. They call Garvey ism the back to africa movement and the idea was that the essence and the fundamental goal of garvey marcus garvey himself and the unite aco was just to transport african people back to africa that's what they say the black star line steamship company was about yeah just creating a steamship line to help africans return and repatriate to the african continent Repatriation is all well, good and beautiful, but that is not the essence of nationhood. That was not the, the fundamental purpose of the UNIA ACL, yeah? And so we're going to um, challenge this and uh, contextualise this by reading from this book, yeah? Uh, More Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey, Volume 3, um, and uh, deal with what Papa Garvey calls the call to Africa. He says... There are many persons who continue in ignorance of the real meaning of the Back to Africa movement. There are many others who wickedly misinterpret and misrepresent the meaning with the idea of frustrating the movement. This also is a betrayal of black ignorance. The Back to Africa movement is a form of expression which conjures up in the mind of the ignorant and of the wicked, a scene of wild haste in the demolition of homes, the breaking up of prosperous business associations, the exasperation of kinship 
with those not of like minds as ourselves. The mad folly of pilgrimages by land to the seaboard, embarkations for various destined ports by fleet of ships across the trackless ocean to the great continent of Africa, a land of ready-made institutions of the most advanced civilizations with social, civic and national amenities providing adequate princely living to each and every immigrant. These are a few of the utopian ideas with which ignorance and wickedness invest the back to Africa movement. But what is the truth of the whole matter? The back to Africa movement is a rather simple, natural, logical and spiritual call to Africa, a spontaneous prompting of irresistible urge has found its birth in the minds of the sons of Africa in all places of the earth in which they dwell. We do not contend that the call to Africa, viz. that her sons should arise and seek her redemption, is natural and inevitable to Africa, bereft of her children, carried into captivity and enslaved in alien lands, herself overrun by alien peoples partitioned among them and her sons enslaved, reduced and degraded in her own soil. Three long centuries of Negro suffering under the iniquities of the slave trade. 300 years of unparalleled horrors reaching down to, to the atrocities of the Belgian Congo and still intolerable conditions prevailing to this very moment could not but move the heaven of justice to vindicate her cause. Slowly and surely, the arm of omnipotence has been outstretched to bring justice to the Negro. His is now passing through the Red Sea wall. His day of victory is at hand. So we see Papa Garvey himself dispelling this idea that we're going to just go back to Africa and live yeah in a ready-made haven we're dispelling that myth first of all the core to africa is not just physical but spiritual it's a state of mind as well as a physical process and secondly the core to africa is a call of duty it's a call to do work it's not a call to go to africa put up your foot yeah and live yeah in the tropical sun and drink coconut water on a daily basis yeah this requires work, right? The conditions of our people at home and abroad require us to put our shoulders to the wheel. So when we go to Africa, we're going to nation build. The ideal of nationhood requires nation building and that requires us to face and confront certain challenges, yeah? So that's Papa Garvey uh, contextualizing the core to Africa within the principle of nationhood and the back to Africa movement. I do hope that is clear because this issue is causing a lot of confusion uh, deliberately by forces who are deliberately confusing the thing in today's time. So the next yeah, uh, fundamental principle of universal African nationalism, Garveyism or African fundamentalism, is African spiritual orthodoxy. So to explain this a little piece here, when we see race for self-reliance and nationhood, all right, through our study of the life and legacy of the most honorable Malcolm Messiah Garvey and the ULIA ACL, it becomes apparent that spirituality and religion is very central, yes, to uh, the development and the uh, ethos, yeah, of the ULIA ACL. It was governed by ritual and, in and the intentionality, yes, of ritual. It was governed by the conscious development of culture um, and a way of life that was catered towards fulfilling the goal of African nationhood. And so because of the significance and the centrality of spirituality and religion to the UNIA ACL, it was felt that it was important to encapsulate that by adding 
African spiritual orthodoxy to the fundamental governing principles of African fundamentalism, Garveyism, universal African nationalism, all right? And as I've already said, Robert Tony Martin was, you know, most welcome for that uh, edition, yeah? The title, the name uh, African spiritual orthodoxy is inspired by the name of what was as close to being an auxiliary uh, of the UNIACL without quite being an auxiliary of the UNIACL, which was the African Orthodox Church, yeah? Its founding member was also the chaplain general of the UNIACL, and he goes by the name of Bishop Alexander Maguire. For the sake of explanation, Orthodox is defined as following or conforming to the traditional or generally accepted rules or beliefs of a religion, ph philosophy, or practice. And so to explain and break down the principle of African spiritual orthodoxy, we're going to go to the words of the prophet himself. If the white man has an ideal of a white god, let him worship his god as he desires. If the yellow man's god is of his race, let him worship his god as he sees fit. The god of Isaac and the god of Jacob let him exist for the race who believes in the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. We Negroes believe in the God of Ethiopia, the everlasting God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, the God of all ages. That is the God in who we believe and we shall worship God through the spectacles of Ethiopia. Necessary to note that um, when he says Ethiopia, he's not referring to specifically to the country that we know today as Ethiopia, which was then more popularly known as Abyssinia. Ethiopia was a term that was used to refer to the African continent uh, in as much as uh, Ethiopian was a common term used to refer to African people in general. And so you see this image of affirming, yes, the blackness of God in the sense that we see God in our own image and through our own spectacles. And we don't just see God in our own image in terms of God, the phenotype yeah, of being black, but our own lens, which means that we, again, look at the thing yeah, through our own uh, civilised and cultural idealisms, as was related in the previous quote from Papa Garvey, uh, related to institution building. In fact, within the extension of that quote, he actually touches on this principle of institution building in relation to religion and says the following. It is incumbent upon him that he also have and control his own institutions based upon his own cultural and civilised idealisms. As for instance, he may have his own church, but it is not necessary for him to adopt the peculiar articles of faith of the churches of alien races. He is not a Hebrew, therefore he would not adopt the Hebrew faith. He is not by origin a Roman Catholic nor an Anglican, because these faiths and religions were founded by white men with an idea of their own. In his religious philosophy, the Negro may safely adopt articles of faith to link him with the Godhead of the Christian faith, and practice such as his particular religion and so likewise with all other institutions. Very powerful and strong statements, yeah, you know what I'm saying, among uh, I and I as a uh, universal African nationalist. Now essentially, um, f first and foremost, I should say, this principle was manifested in the UNIA ACO uh, again, through the development of the African Orthodox Church and through the general meetings yeah, of um, the UNIA ACL, all of them began with rituals. The UNIA ACL wrote its own hymns and developed its own rituals. And as Chaplain General, uh, Baba Alexander Maguire wrote what is called the Universal Catechism. Yeah? And it was primarily used um, with the juveniles, the young people in the organisation, and took them through... Uh, a, a religious education that was designed to particularize African people, all right? Um, and so it, it was beyond just the, the, the any denomination uh, of Christianity as African people knew it um, at that time. In fact, uh, Baba George, Alexander George Maguire says, you must forget the white gods, erase the white gods from your hearts. We must go back to the native church to our own true God. So this is this could be a presentation in and of itself, all right? But 
Um, there are a number of ways in which Garveyites yeah, have developed on these ideas. Yeah? And two primary streams uh, of thought have existed. The first is that whatever religious tradition that we are in, we must seek and consciously develop uh, an African expression of the religion. Yes. So that's, that's for those of us who are in uh, Christianity, Judaism or Islam, as many members of the UNAACL were at that time yeah, and are today. All right. Uh, but that the, the African history of those religions must be emphasized and an African expression peculiar, yes, and necessary to meet the needs of African people must be developed. The other stream of consciousness that developed was that we must return to and evolve, restore dignity to and functionality to our indigenous African spiritual systems, yeah? And so that stream of consciousness tended to discard or evolve out of uh, the Abrahamic religions as they are referred to and going us on Ifa, yeah, uh, traditions, or going us on Kumina or affirm Bambule uh, ritual or affirm uh, uh, Kandomble or Santeria or uh, affirm the Odinani, yeah, among the Ibo, yeah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Indigenous African spiritual systems in general. And that's where you get the ideal of African spirituality as an affirmation because we're asking the question now where yes if we're supposed to develop our spiritual focus based upon our own cultural and uh civilized idealisms where do we go to find those cultural and civilized idealisms yeah and so we see this in the affirmation even of um the uh islamic or islamized empires yeah of Africa and their unique African expressions of Islam, the um, unique African expressions of Christianity in the Americas, such as the Shango Baptist uh, and so on and so forth, all right? And then ultimately, again, you have those who say, well, actually, well, that's gonna restore and revive our ancestral traditions and make them functional in today's world. So all of these uh, permutations and dynamics exist among Gaviat consciousness. This inclination uh, towards spiritual and religious exploration among members of the UNIA ACL led to the development of entirely new spiritual systems. And one of the main examples of this is, in, in, is housed and encapsulated in this book here, yeah, entitled The Holy Pibi, written by a shepherd Robert Affley Rogers, yeah? The Holy Pibi is also known as the Black Man's Bible. And so when you hear the Black Man Bible, you kind of get an understanding or overstanding of where he was going and what his intentions were. Uh, and Robert Affley Rogers was a member of the UNIA ACL uh, in New Jersey uh, and was inspired to develop a new spiritual tradition that reflected the desires, the intentionality, and the mission and the destiny of African people. In fact, this is the first text uh, in which uh, Papa Garvey himself was declared as a prophet. And so when you see the Rastafari movement, this is also one of the key texts that inspired the development of the Rastafari movement, which can be said to a significant degree to be the most enduring, yes, of the spiritual traditions that come out of the Garvey movement. Many of the founding mothers and fathers of Rastafari were in fact members of the Garvey movement um, in the United States, in Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean. The Rastafari movement kind of draws on both ends of that spectrum that I spoke about earlier in terms of uh, finding an African historical and spiritual root within the the, the Abrahamic traditions and also drawing heavily yeah, from our indigenous African spiritual systems as they were preserved and evolved in um, the Caribbean. And so things like the promised land becomes Mama Africa, you know, Zion yeah, becomes uh, Mama Africa and the focus on uh, the, the, the psalm which says uh, Ethiopia shall stretch for her hands on to God. And so we see this inclination towards developing a spiritual system that is specific to our Africanness um, and gives expression to our Africanness. And Papa Garvey was certainly guiding us towards uh, the development of a more African expression uh, of spirituality. And that evolution was in train 
uh, in the time of Papa Garvey and has developed uh, since then. And many of those who have um, evolved into the concept of what we call African spirituality see ourselves as taking that to that argument, that logic to its logical conclusion. Yeah, we must develop our Africanness within our Africanness. This is given greater expression. In the words of Mama Amy J. It's Garvey in the book Garvey and Garveyism, where she says, The wearing of uniforms and robes of office by Garveyites had a deep significance and psychological effect. Had Garvey landed in Africa, he would have discarded the uniform and European attire for tribal gowns to become uh, a part of the masses and thus impressed them while satisfying his inner longing for Africanization. So pursuing our own culture and civilized idealisms naturally, yes, produces the idea of Africanization. And this is where you get the idea, for example, of African people discarding European names and reclaiming our own African names. Yeah, this was done many times, yeah on the African continent in particular, yeah, by Africans who were on the African nationalist and Pan-Africanist train on the African continent. Some of them, because of the indoctrination of Christianity and European imperialism, were given European names at birth, yeah. For example, uh, the, the ancestor Kobin Asechi had a European name, discarded it and reclaimed the name Kobin Asechi. For example, Mojola Agbebi, yes, who was born with a European name, Pastor Mojola Agbebi, was born with a, sorry, a European name, and later discarded to reclaim an African name. So those, the, all of those dynamics relate to Africanization and the principle, yes, of African spiritual orthodoxy or developing ourselves according to our own culture and civilized idealisms. So to summarize, Garveyism, more properly referred to as African fundamentalism or universal African nationalism, has four fundamental principles. Race first, self-reliance, nationhood, and African spiritual orthodoxy. And to conclude, we are going to conclude with the word sounds of Queen Mama Amy Jakes Garvey uh, in the book, uh, More Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. She says, Garveyism is not only a theoretical philosophy, but a working idealism geared towards the crying needs of an entire race. So, as I've been referring to Garveyism, African fundamentalism, universal African nationalism, as an ideology, a philosophy, yes, it will be more properly referred to as a working idealism. Queen Mama Amy J. S. Garvey is very, very wise, yeah, in uh, her use of this terminology. What it says to me is that we evolve the philosophy with the practice of its implementation, solving the problems uh, of our people, yeah? It's a working idealism. These ideals, yes, are meant to guide our practice and our practice is supposed to evolve the strategies and the implementation, yeah, um, of these ideals. And so this is important because the universal African nationalist philosophy is still very much in play. It's still very much alive and the various different Garveyites and Garveyite organizations around the world are implementing it. And that's another story for another time. That concludes our episode of the Pan-African Question. What is Garveyism? I hope that this session has been edifying yeah, and educational. If you have a Pan-African question, please leave it in the comment section below and I will endeavor my best to do an episode around the answer to your question. In future, we will be addressing questions such as what is neocolonialism? What does a, a black nationalist or Pan-Africanist government look like uh, what, towards uh, an African-centered economic theory and issues such as those, all right? So I look forward to, to developing those and sharing them with you and getting your feedback. Do please, yeah, leave your feedback and your contributions, your challenges even to this particular episode in the comment section below. And as we conclude, we 
the end as we began. Tendam Wale, be thankful unto the mother, father, creator of the universe. Kudzai Mazem Mokoro, give praises unto our great ancestors. Abibi Tomi, Abibi Fahodie, African power and African liberation for all African people. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you.